Right, hopefully you're with us for the uh, P1 exam revision live stream. Uh, as I said in the little warm up video, we're doing this uh, a day early this time uh, to give you time to watch the video, uh, sort of digest it, uh, go through all the bits, make some notes and uh, then you can watch it again for a quick reminder tomorrow as well if you want just before the exam. Uh, the exam is on Wednesday um, at uh, 1.30 so you've got the morning as well. Uh, where you maybe have some lessons and you can get the teacher to put the video on uh, we'll send out the link so uh, you can go through it again uh, and hopefully everyone will get the most benefit out of it we can to get that most benefit though as I've said in all my other videos well, we've had a few questions come in but not as many as I would like uh, you can email this email address communications at folkestoneacademy.com uh, with any questions on any of the topics that uh, I cover or don't cover in this exam that you're still unsure of uh, so if you have any questions, we'll either display them on the board, but if you don't want your name displayed, then uh, do just um, let us know that you want to remain anonymous and we can keep it anonymous, or uh, Miss Walker can type a, type a response to you uh, and you can find out your answer that way if it's a quick question. So as per normal, going to do about half an hour of me talking uh, and then um, we'll see if we've got any questions coming. If we have any questions, I'll go through those for about 15 minutes. If not... I'll carry on through um, and do another half hour, 15 minutes at the end. Now, in terms of the content, I should, looking at P1, be able to get through most things. Uh, there's really only two major topics that come up and slight variations of each that I need to cover. Uh, and that's what I want you to hold on to for your exams. There's really only two things in P1 that you need to know. Obviously, lots about them, but two main sort of areas to focus your revision. So... Uh, we're going to give you or generate the energy required to pass your exams in this session. Don't worry if you can't see that. Okay, my other slides are on a white background with a black um, black writing, so hopefully it's a bit clearer. But if not, as I said, you can access the slides if you want to follow along uh, on our science website. Uh, so you can you can follow the PowerPoint uh, on there um, and have access to that as we go through. Or you can access it afterwards. Obviously, it will be posted. So. Moving in to our first sort of topic, uh, and this topic is one to do with heat energy transfer that I pretty much can say with 100% certainty that, that will come up in some form or another. Uh, it's a major topic, so there will be questions on it uh, in, one, in one form, uh, and there's three methods of heat transfer that you need to know a bit about. They are conduction, convection, and radiation. They're all going on in this picture, if you can see it. Apologies for the light today. It's very bright outside, making the board a bit dark. Uh, but I'll talk through everything that will be on there anyway, and I'll write some bits onto this uh, flip chart as well. So we've got conduction, convection, and radiation all going on in this picture of a saucepan that's being heated over a stove using a heating element. That's what it's there. Um, you also need to know how evaporation of a liquid transfers energy. Uh, and that's going to be part of it as well. Uh, and I'll go into that a little bit. But there's not too much you need to know about evaporation. <coughs> just a small piece uh, of how it takes energy out of a liquid when the particles leave. So, going through these one at a time. We're going to start looking at conduction. Now, conduction is a method of heat transfer that takes place in solids. Um, and this diagram shows it where we are heating up uh, a solid rod and the energy is being transferred along the rod, so along the length of the rod. And we need to be able to describe and explain how that process is taking place. Okay? In the diagram, you can sort of see it if you can access the diagram, but really I'm going to take you through the stages. Just like before I've said, if you've got a three mark question or four mark question, you need to make four or three points about it that's what you need to do with conduction, so explaining conduction. So to explain that method of heat transfer, okay, you need to go through the stages. The first thing is, where this Bunsen is, it's supplying energy to these atoms. And when, when they're heated, they pick up energy. Heat is just a type of energy. And these atoms are going to gain heat energy from the Bunsen burner. When they gain that energy, this causes them to vibrate. So the particles begin to vibrate and move. Now, as I said, conduction takes place in solids. So in solids, the particles are locked together. They can't really go anywhere. Okay? So the particles are locked and uh, they can't really move. So what they do is they actually collide with each other because they're locked in position. Um, they're hitting each other. When I do this in class, when I teach it, um, I actually sort of get the students to sort of link together in a sort of line all the way down the room. 
and then we can start some sort of motion all the way down it. Uh, if I start to supply energy to one end uh, and they start to move because they're linked to the next one, they will start to move as well. And eventually that energy gets passed along to the next atom and then to the next atom and the next atom. And they get passed all the way along from atom to atom because they're colliding with each other with more energy and it gets passed down the line. The heat gets conducted along the material. Okay, so those are the stages. Atoms are heated, they gain energy. When they gain energy, they vibrate. That causes them to collide with the particles they are next to. And this causes the energy to be passed along, along the chain, along the line of atoms, all the way along to the end. Instead of atoms, you can say particles. Um, those, those are the words you should stick to for conduction or yeah, particles in a, a heat transfer through conduction. With conduction, one thing that's not on the slide is conduction takes place particularly well in um, metals. And metals conduct, uh, well, I was going to say electricity, but it's because the two are tied together. If ever you get the question about why does uh, a metal conduct, it's always looking for a similar phrase. So the same phrase is always uh, what it's sort of getting at. Metal conducts due to three, not the number three, but three electrons. Okay? That's what causes the metal to conduct heat and indeed electricity uh, very well. So if they're talking about conduction in a metal, or why is conduction particularly good in a metal, it's because it has three electrons. And what happens is those electrons, when they gain energy, they can move all the way down this solid and therefore they can carry the energy all the way down from one end of the metal to the other. Okay? So metal, if you have a question about why does metal conduct, or metal's a good conductor, uh, it's because it has free electrons. I will just mention at this point that the opposite to a conductor uh, is an insulator. Okay? Insulators are poor conductors, that's, that's exactly what they are. So an insulator is the opposite of a conductor really, it's a poor conductor, something that doesn't conduct either heat or electricity, but really we're talking about heat in P1, heat energy. An insulator is a poor conductor, it won't conduct heat very well. So things that are good conductors are things like metal, things that are insulators are things like plastic and wood, uh, those sort of materials. Okay? Because conduction takes place in solid, and the things we talked about here are atoms, they relies on particles. So you need particles for conduction to take place. It's really important for conduction to happen. Particles are involved in this process. Okay? So that's conduction. Next of all, we will look at convection. So convection is the method of heat transfer that takes place in liquids and gases. These are called collectively fluids, uh, but liquids and gases, you can just think of, of them as at this point. Um, in terms of states of matter, you need to have an understanding for P1 of what the particles are like in the different states of matter. Uh, I haven't got it on the slide and I won't really draw it up because it's kind of key stage 3 learning that in a solid the particles are li long, 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 saying the wrong words, linked together in a regular arrangement. So they're, they're locked to each other and can't move. They can vibrate on the spot but they're not, not free to move about. Uh, whereas in a liquid, the particles are still touching, close, but they're able to move over each other and flow. And that's why they, they fit the shape of a container they are put in. And then uh, gases, the particles in that are spaced apart, so they have gaps between them and they're free to move anywhere. Uh, and they're often flying about, colliding with each other, bouncing out and spreading out. They generally spread to fill whatever container they are placed in. Okay? So do remember the states of matter and what the particles are like in there, but uh, in terms of heat transfer, convection takes place in liquids and gases. So, this is a convection current going on inside this kettle. Now, don't worry if you can't see the diagram again, because I'm going to go through the stages in it. And again, this is another one where you may be asked to describe the, the steps that are taking place when heat energy is transferred through convection. So, it's very important you get the steps correct. The first step is when particles in a liquid gain energy, they spread out. Okay? So they spread out and get further apart. 
And when they get further apart, that actually causes them to become less dense. Okay, so when they spread apart, they become less dense. Now, less dense uh, means sort of the fact they get lighter. It's not quite as simple as that, but, but for the purposes of this, we can think of them getting lighter. And when they become lighter, they actually rise upwards. So they move upwards. And that's what's happening in diagrams. Particles gain energy, and that causes them to spread out. They become less dense, and they rise up. And as they rise up and they get to the top, they actually uh, lose some energy. And when they lose energy at the surface, that actually causes them to become more dense and fall back down. So more dense, they get heavier, and they sink back down. This actually sets up uh, a convection current in the uh, substance, in the liquid, in the gas that's actually taking place. So to show it in another way, to show the particles that are going, uh, going on in this process, or what the particles are doing in this process, because remember in science questions, if you can't remember these stages, uh, you can actually use a diagram to show what's going on. So if I have a beaker of water, and I have a liquid in it, okay, if I have particles here, in liquid, they're not quite as regular as a solid, but they're all still touching. And if I supply a heat source to the bottom, okay, that's my Bunsen, heating them up, those particles spread out. They're still fairly close, but they do spread out somewhat. And when they do, that causes them to become less dense and rise up. When they're at the surface, this is where I'm going to come into the other process that's going on, which is called evaporation. Okay. Evaporation is where these particles that have spread out due to gaining energy okay, and become less dense, risen to the surface, some of them will have enough energy to escape the surface of the liquid. And they will fly out as a gas. And when they leave as a gas, they actually take energy with them. That's how the energy is being lost in this process. So they actually take energy with them when they evaporate. So if we want to keep energy in, we want to stop evaporation because that's actually taking energy out of the system. That's how it does it. By these particles gaining enough energy that they actually leave the liquid phase and become a gas and actually float out the top. And when that energy is lost, as I said, these particles come closer together again and they become more dense and they sink back down. And it goes on again. It will go around again. It will happen both ways, so it will be circulating around there and circulating around there. Uh, but it's not, lots of convection currents will be set up in it, particularly if you've got something like this where there's a lot of heat underneath. Okay? So convection currents, really important, happen in liquids and gases. Um, it's how radiators heat rooms in homes as well, so they can ask you about radiators. Particles gain energy, spread out. When they spread out, they rise because they're less dense. When they rise to the top, they carry energy with them. They lose some energy at the top, usually for evaporation, and then they come back together, become more dense, and sink back around. And it goes on again. Okay. So that's convection, and what's called a convection current happening in a liquid and a gas. And last of all, uh, we have radiation as well. So radiation is the process by which heat can travel through a vacuum. And a vacuum, if you're unsure, is the absence of any particles. So it's where there's no particles whatsoever. Space is a vacuum. It's empty, completely empty. And on a day like today, we've been receiving infrared radiation, which is heat radiation, uh, from the sun, and it's caused us to be quite warm. It's quite warm in here today. Um, so this is how the energy reaches us through space from the sun, or the heat energy reaches us. Important things to know about uh, radiation, apart from the fact it can travel through a vacuum, is that uh, objects can emit and absorb infrared radiation or heat radiation. All objects can. And the amount they do it depends on like, how hot they are. The hotter an object it is, the more radiation it is going to be given out. So the sun, as you can imagine, is quite hot, uh, and therefore it's giving out lots and lots of infrared radiation, and that's being sent out to the Earth, okay? and that's where we receive the energy from. Okay? So the hotter an object, the more uh, radiation it's going to be given out. 
Now you can increase the rate of infrared radiation emittance or absorption by doing a few things. Um, by that I mean you can increase the, uh, the, the speed at which an object gives out its heat by changing a few things about it. The first thing you can do is make the object black. So black colours absorb um, heat uh, radiation and they also give out heat radiation quicker than light objects. So white objects will give out uh, or reflect back more of the radiation. So radiation is absorbed. So my suit being quite dark, uh, today's not an ideal time to wear it because it's a dark so it's absorbing more uh, radiation onto it and it makes me warmer than if it was light coloured. You can also make the object matte. Now matte is the opposite to uh, shiny. So shiny surfaces will reflect a lot of that radiation back out, whereas a matte means a dull like, like colour I guess you could use, although it's not the perfect word to use, but dull in appearance uh, and it absorbs the radiation in. So we can make it dark, we can make it matte, that's going to absorb more infrared radiation or emit more radiation. And the last thing we can do is increase the surface area. So the wider the surface area, the more infrared radiation it's going to give out. Okay, so by increasing the surface area, we can do things like uh, putting folds in something or fins into something. Um, and they do sometimes talk about saucepans being used to heat up, like we had in the example early on of a saucepan. Uh, and the bottom of that is usually coloured black, so it can absorb. It's usually dull or matte. So it absorbs the heat from the stove. And if you wanted to, if you really wanted to make it better at in absorbing this infrared radiation, you would, you would increase its surface area by putting uh, little grooves on it or changing the surface. Or I've seen them ask about fins on the bottom of saucepans, which are just uh, making it increase the surface area. So those are the ways you can increase the amount, or the rate, I should say, speed at which you can emit or absorb uh, infrared radiation. As I've said at the start, heat transfer is a big topic and I, like I say, I don't like to guarantee things in exams because I haven't seen the paper and there's no way I can tell exactly what's going to be on it, but I would be very surprised if there wasn't a question about at least one, if not two or all three of these methods of heat transfer. Um, they do like to tie it into a topic and that topic is vacuum flask is quite often used in one form or another. Um, don't worry if you can't see this on the board, uh, the ideas I will go through. But vacuum flasks are designed to keep a liquid that's inside of them warm for as long as possible. Okay? So it might be a cup of tea or coffee. You want to keep as warm as possible inside the flask. Now there's several ways that it can do that. And all of those ways minimise heat loss through uh, conduction, convection and radiation. Okay? That's the idea. All of them will minimise these three things. Okay. Also, one I haven't mentioned is it also minimises evaporation as well. The ways it does that, okay, it's called a vacuum flask. The reason it's called a vacuum flask is it's actually got two layers to it. It has an outer layer and it has an inner layer. And between that outer and inner layer is a vacuum. There are no particles whatsoever. If there are no particles in this vacuum layer around the flask, that means conduction can't happen very easily because it needs particles to go through. It also means convection can't happen because that needs liquid or gas particles to occur. So the vacuum is actually minimising the amount of conduction and convection that can take place uh, from the hot liquid to the cold air outside. Okay, so that's the first thing about it. The second thing is the actual inner layer there's a shiny, like silvered glass if you look inside one of these flasks. Um, and the reason, the reason for that is, is the shininess reflects back that uh, radiation I was talking about earlier. So when the heat's trying to radiate out, the, the shiny glass reflects it back in. Uh, and therefore it stays inside the flask and it can't escape through radiation. The walls of the vacuum flask are made for, uh, with plastic. And the reason they're made with plastic is because uh, plastic is a poor conductor. So even if it could conduct heat uh, through the vacuum or heat could get through the vacuum to the outer walls, it's still not going to conduct it very easily because plastic's such a poor conductor. And then last of all, we've got a plastic stopper on the top. 
that plastic stopper minimises heat loss through evaporation. The particles can't evaporate out the top, so therefore they can't take the energy with them and leave. So they're really cleverly designed things, um, and exam boards like asking questions about them, um, because they minimise conduction, convection and radiation. The three types of, well, and evaporation, maybe the four types of heat energy transfer we've talked about so far. Okay. So that's it on heat energy transfer, but we still need to go on to other energy transfers. Um, and these come up, come up a lot as well. Now, when we're looking at other energy transfers, I've got a little acronym I like to use, SHELAC GEM, for just remembering the different types of energy that you actually get. And I'm sure uh, anyone who's in one of my classes could be screaming these at me, but I'll go through what that acronym actually means. So, SHELAC GEM stands for the different types of energy. So we have S, which stands for sound. Okay. We have H, which stands for heat. We have E, which can be electrical. We have L, which can be light. A, which is atomic, sometimes called nuclear. By the way, heat could be called thermal as well, thermal energy. C, which is chemical. That's the energy stored in... Uh, like food and fuels. Then you've got K, which is kinetic. Kinetic is movement energy. So kinetic is the energy of moving particles. Uh, that's what you need to know about that. So if anything's moving, it will have kinetic energy. G is gravitational. Okay. And that's a potential energy held in any object due to its position uh, on the earth, so position away from the surface of the earth, because it wants to, if I release it, fall down. E could be electrical, but we've already had that, so in this case it's elastic. Okay, that's the energy stored in a stretched spring or elastic band. And then M is magnetic. Okay. Those are the types of energy uh, that you need to know. Now, I'm going to say that the main ones that come up in energy transfers are going to be sound, heat, uh, electrical could be in there, light, chemical, okay, kinetic, and occasionally gravitational as well. Those are the main ones uh, for P1 that will come up more often than not. Atomic, elastic, magnetic, not really so much. Um, gravitational even probably a bit less, but definitely still one to know. Uh, but the others, uh, they're all ones that are going to be used qu quite regularly. Okay. You need to be able to use those types of energy to show uh, energy transfers. Now, if you can't see the picture um, on the screen when you're watching this, this is a light bulb, okay? so an electric light bulb. And you need to be able to say the energy transfers that are going on in this light bulb. So the energy that goes into the light bulb is obviously electrical. We know that electrical energy goes in, and uh, we need to say the energy that comes out. So a light bulb will give up light energy. That's the energy we want. But you may also be asked what energy is wasted in the process. So what energy transfer is, is the energy wasted in this? Now for a, for a light bulb, the energy is going to be wasted as heat. Okay? So heat is quite often a, a a big waste of energy. Lots of things, unless they want heat, like a hairdryer for example, uh, will be wasting energy as heat. A TV is wasting energy as heat. The back of it gets hot. Uh, your PlayStation 4, if you've got one, uh, playing Overwatch instead of watching this, uh, will be wasting energy as heat. They get quite hot actually. Uh, so, like I said, that's a wasted source of energy, or wasted energy. Okay. So you need to be able to identify the energy transfers in different uh, processes. Now, I'm not going to go too much more over that because it's kind of common sense. They will ask you about an appliance and you'll have to say the energy that goes in. Do remember that chemical energy is the energy stored in fuels, so like petrol or food. They're all fuels. They go into something, they're made up of chemicals, and they provide the energy. Okay? And remember that kinetic means movement, so kinetic energy is movement. You could be asked to calculate the energy transfer. Now, I appreciate it's probably uh, quite hard to see on here, so I'll draw it up. 
So we put it, uh, the energy transferred, the way you work that out, by an electrical device. Energy transferred is equal to the power times the time that object is on for. Now the tricky thing to watch out for in this is energy transfer is, is the units. This should be in joules. Uh, so you should have that in joules. Okay. The power is in watts. Um, and the time, this is important, is in seconds. Now often they'll give you the time in uh, minutes. They'll say, this appliance has been on for two minutes. Uh, it's 60 watts. How much energy has been transferred? You need to realise that two minutes is actually 120 seconds. So you need to do that conversion. Each minute is 60 seconds. So you'll need to convert it uh, by times in the number of minutes by 60 to get it into seconds. Okay, so do be aware. They could even be really nasty and give you a time in hours. You would need to realise there are 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds in a minute. So you have to times the number of hours by 60 and times it by 60 again to get the number of seconds. That's if they're feeling incredibly nasty, uh, but like I said, this does need to be in seconds. Okay? These are not the symbols that will be given for these things. Energy is E, uh, if you see it on the formula sheet, so E is equal to V times T, uh, is the symbols. But in an exam, I know you can't see this on the screen, don't worry about it, but you will be given a formula sheet uh, which has uh, five different formulas, two of which are pretty much the same. Uh, for calculations you'll need to do in Science A, uh, Physics. So this is core physics. Uh, so there's not too many on this sheet. Uh, and one of them is this, so you don't need to remember it, but you just need to remember that these are the units uh, for them. They're not given on this sheet, so make sure you get it in the correct units uh, and you'll be able to do those calculations. So remember, shellac gem, different types of energy involved in energy transfers and that formula you'll be given, that's how you work out the energy transferred by an appliance. Okay? You can also, with electrical appliances, be asked to work out their efficiency. No energy transfer that you will come across is 100% efficient. Okay? Energy is always wasted. Now, I did hear about a light bulb that was developed at MIT in America uh, that they, they say is 120% efficient. Now that's not possible really because nothing can be over 100% efficient. Uh, but they actually used a, a light bulb that actually took heat energy from the surroundings and converted it to light as well as the electrical, electrical energy it was supplied with. Really though, you need to remember that no energy transfer should be over 100% efficient. And none of the ones you're going to be asked are even going to be 100% efficient. So you need to make sure that when you do your calculations for efficiency, uh, you are not getting an answer above 100%. Uh, if you do, then you've gone wrong somehow uh, and you need to try the calculation again. Okay? You can show efficiency as one of these diagrams. This diagram is called a Sankey diagram. and I know that sounds a hilarious name, but uh, it is called a Sankey diagram. And you could be asked to draw one or you could be asked to, to analyse one to work out some energies in and energies out. The way these diagrams work are oh, this the width of this bar over here is the total amount of energy supplied in. So the energy in, in this case, if you can't read it, is electrical energy. This is again a light bulb. So 100 joules of electrical energy goes in to this light bulb. As I say, it's the width of the bar that's important. Not the length that way, the width. That is the amount of energy in. So in an exam, you could be given a Sankey diagram like this on graph paper, and you have to count the number of squares that would be the amount of energy going in to the appliance, the number of squares. Um, or you could be given a, a sheet of graph paper or some space with graph lines on it, and you could be asked to draw a Sankey diagram for 100 joules. You need to count how many squares there are and use however many squares to equal however many joules. So if there was 10 squares and this was 100 joules, uh, I could make it each square is 10 joules and it would be the whole width. Okay? The energy that goes straight across, that's the useful energy transferred. In this case, because it's a light bulb, that's light energy. And 75 joules is usefully transferred, the 100 joules that goes in, into light energy. Okay? So 75 goes through from 100 that comes in. 
and the 25 uh, that's left actually goes down here. And this is wasted energy that goes down here. In this case, it's heat energy. So that light bulb is wasting uh, heat energy and it's going like another route, if you like. So that energy is not being used for, for what we want it to be. We could do a calculation on the efficiency of this uh, energy transfer. And the way we do that, that calculation of energy transfer is by using another formula that's on the formula sheet. The efficiency is equal to the useful energy out divided by the total energy in. Okay? That will tell us efficiency as a decimal. Okay? Now, it depends what they're asking. You can actually leave efficiency like that sometimes unless they want the percentage efficiency. Uh, and on the formula sheet, it actually gives you, I'm going to have to squeeze this in, this times 100 in brackets. Because to, to get it as a percentage, you would just need to do it times 100. Now, in the example I've got on the board, okay, of the light bulb, where 100 joules of energy goes in and 75 comes out, okay, my efficiency is, well, useful energy out, that's 75 joules, okay, comes out, it's useful. Um, and my electrical energy in is 100, my total energy in is 100, and that leaves me with uh, an efficiency of 0.75. Okay? Now, if they wanted a percentage efficiency, if they were looking for a percentage efficiency, I would just times that by 100 at the end and say this is 75% efficient. Okay? So that's how I could do efficiency calculations. You could do the same thing with power. Okay, so if you're given a power, this could be useful power out and total power in if you've got an electrical device. Okay, so remember that could be either way, but it's either way on the formula sheet. So efficiency, you'll have the formula on your handy formula sheet. There'll be two uh, equations for it. You just need to work out if you're doing it for energy or for power, but essentially they're the same calculation. Uh, you could be asked to do it from a Sankey diagram such as this. This is a diagram to show the efficiency of a device. Uh, only 75 gets used, 25 gets wasted. They could give you a Sankey diagram where one of these values is missing and you would have to work it out. The total energy in must equal the total energy out and that's going by both parts. So if I add up 75, and 25, I hope you can see that the total energy out is equal to the 100 that went in. Okay? So remember, those must balance. The amount that comes out must equal the amount that goes in. Okay? We've had about 30 minutes just over. Um, we still haven't had any questions come in. Uh, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm becoming like a bit of a broken record, constantly sort of saying, oh, put your questions in. Uh, please do, because like I say, it allows me to, to really respond to the things you want to know a bit about. Uh, I know from the feedback I've had from you guys that you're all getting um, a lot out of this in terms of, um, like I say, it's really preparing you for the exams. But do remember, if you've got a specific um, query, that, that if you ask it, then uh, like I say, I can go directly to that. Because um, I generally don't cover everything in this because I don't have time in the hour and a half. So if there's something you're uncertain of, even if it's a small thing, then please do email in that communications at folksacademy.com. Uh, if only to hear, to stop hearing me keep saying that. And I will say there was a question about auxin in the biology exam, someone emailed in, and that actually came up on the paper. So it was a really good question that I wouldn't have probably gone through otherwise, and it came up in the actual exam. So it's good to know that can happen. Anyway, so I'll move on, okay, carry on, because there's a lot in P1 anyway, so I will be able to get through uh, most of the, the content if I, if I carry on as well. Generating electricity. Now this is a big topic, so I, I almost guarantee there will be uh, a question about this as well. As I say, can never 100% guarantee, but pretty close uh, to the point where generating electricity in one form or another will come up. Um, so we've had heat transfer, I said, was a really big topic. And knowing, re being really clear on how conduction and convection work and about the differences in radiation and how you speed it up and change it, slow it down. Uh, generating electricity is another, another one. It can be generated in lots of different ways. 
Okay, and each of them have their own pros and cons. Okay, it's good points and bad points about each. We can split them into two sort of main categories, really. We've got our renewable energies, okay, and we have our non-renewable energies. Now, some of these are grouped together. Coal, oil, gas, they're kind of your fossil fuels, and they'll be grouped together, really. And nuclear fission or nuclear power, that's a separate sort of category in the non-renewables. And then in the renewables, I should say, you've got like sun, wind, hydroelectric, HEP, hydroelectric power. They do sometimes write it just as HEP. Uh, you need to know that's hydroelectric. Uh, I'll talk about exactly what it is when I get to it, but hydro meaning water, so water power. Waves, also to do with water. Geothermal, again, if you're not sure what geothermal is, I'll come to it when I talk about it in a little, little second. And then biofuels and biodiesel. Um, I don't talk too much about this last one, but it is worth knowing that it's a type of renewable energy. The reason I'm not going to go into it too much now is because if you watch my chemistry video, I talked a lot about biodiesel and biofuels such as ethanol in that, and they're under those brackets. Okay? Uh, fuels that are made from plants is really what that's talking about, and that's renewable because you can always grow more plants. Um, so generally, as I say, if you can't see this diagram, don't worry too much, I'll talk you through it. Also, as I said, you can access the slides on the science website. Uh, because I'm doing this video early, you can do that tomorrow if you wish. Um, this is generally how energy in a power station is generated. There's a, there's a sort of flow diagram I'll show on the next slide, which shows the overall process. Okay? Fuels, such as coal, oil, um, uh, gas, are stores of chemical energy. Okay, they have chemical energy in them. Um, when you burn that chemical, or those chemicals, they actually release that energy. And that energy is released as heat. So that's the transfer going on. Chemical energy to heat energy. That heat energy is actually used to heat up water. And it gets water so hot, it can actually turn to steam. Because superheated water uh, turns to steam. That steam is movement. So it's moving about. So it's actually kinetic energy. Uh, in this process. So that steam has lots of heat energy which is using as kinetic energy. Those particles of steam are whizzing around. And because the steam is pushed out into this, which is the turbine, uh, this is the boiler where the, the heat is generated and the water is boiled, it goes into a turbine and that turbine is like just giant fan blades that get pushed around by the steam. So the steam actually pushes them around and they spin. Uh, and when they spin, they're actually linked to a generator. And that generator spins as well. Now, fortunately, you don't need to know how the generator works, but it actually generates electrical energy. When it spins around, it actually creates electrical energy. So by that transfer of chemical energy to heat energy, to heat up the water, turn it to steam, okay, uh, that kinetic energy spins the turbines, which generates electrical energy which is then sent uh, down a wire to the national grid, which we will come on to as a separate section. This sort of Sankey diagram along the bottom shows how energy is wasted during that process. If you've got 100 joules, again we're using simple numbers, if we use 100 joules of chemical energy at the start in the fuel, there's actually going to be about 20 joules lost as heat through the process there's actually going to be 40 joules lost in the water, cooling down, because we have to cool the water back down before it can be pumped back around. Okay, so 40 joules is wasted uh, in that cooling process. There's actually about 5 joules lost in the generator due to inefficiencies. If something's turning round, um, it generally creates friction, which is wasting heat energy. And that means out of the 100 joules of fuel that you burn, only 35 joules of electrical energy is generated. For every 100 joules of chemical energy you put in, only 35 joules of electrical energy comes out. That means the process is about 35% efficient. So all power stations work at about 35% efficiency. Uh, so they're not particularly efficient. They can actually improve efficiency, and I don't know if this will come up, but I've seen it, seen it mentioned a few times. Uh, they can improve efficiency by using some of this heat uh, in the heat loss and in this water that has to be cooled down they actually pump that into local homes and it's actually used to heat houses and heat homes 
and therefore that energy isn't wasted, it's actually used for something useful. And that actually can increase the efficiency up to about 80% efficiency. So uh, that's a good use and a way you can make a power station more efficient. Okay. As I said, that flow diagram is there and that's how all fossil fuel, diagram, uh, fossil fuel diagrams, fossil fuel power stations actually work through this process of taking chemical energy in the fuel, uh, converting it to heat by burning it, creating kinetic energy by boiling water, turning it to steam, pushing around a turbine, so pushing a turbine around, which is kinetic energy again, and then the generator converts that kinetic energy, because it's linked to the turbine, into electrical energy, which is sent out and used to power buildings and homes and, and whatever else needs it. Okay. Uh, so fossil fuels, we talked about coal, gas, and uh, I keep forgetting, coal, gas, and oil, uh, like crude oil. They have some big advantages, okay? Now, a lot of papers or exam questions you might get are on the bias side. They're talking about us moving away from fossil fuels, and there are disadvantages to them, but there are some advantages as well. They are reliable. You know that if you put in a certain amount of coal, you are going to get a certain amount of energy out. So they're reliable, we know that, that's a fact. Okay? We can get that energy easily. Um, gas, in particular, has a quick start-up time. Now, the other fossil fuels are fairly quick to start, and maybe I should just say what start-up time means. That means when you actually switch on uh, the boiler um, that you have here, how long does it take to start generating electricity? Now, in gas, you actually uh, burn it really quickly. So gas, when it lights, it gives out that heat really quickly, so you start getting electricity really quickly. Um, why that's important is because they talk about meeting a peak demand. That's to do with the fact that the demand, the amount people want electricity, is not always constant. People want more at certain times. They actually did a study a few years ago that when the commercial break, the adverts came on in the middle of Coronation Street, there was a massive spike in the need for electricity because everyone started boiling a kettle for their mid-Coronation Street cup of tea. That's a true study that was done. Now, if you need to supply that amount of energy to meet that demand, and in the exam questions they can talk about supply and demand, and you have to talk about the sort of energy mix that's needed, gas is good because it, you can turn it on and it can meet that supply, that demand peak or spike when there's that sudden demand for electricity. So the supply can meet that demand. Okay? So you can use it to top up other forms of generated electricity. And another advantage to fossil fuels is the infrastructure is already in place. What that means is we already have the power stations that are able to supply energy through fossil fuels. So we don't need to build new power stations to cope with the demands that we have. Big disadvantages though, obviously. Okay? We are running out of fossil fuels. That's a major disadvantage, okay? and there will come a time when we don't have any left. Uh, so we need to consider that. They release carbon dioxide, which links to global warming. I'm sure those of you who watch my chemistry video will know I banged on the whole time about Carbon dioxide, link in your mind for global warming, greenhouse effect, climate change, whatever you want to call it. Okay, that link hopefully is still already there, and you should know that by burning fossil fuels, you're giving out carbon dioxide, which leads to global warming. Similarly, it can also release sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide, due to sulfur impurities in the fuel, leads to acid rain. Again, those links there, sulfur dioxide, acid rain. Acid rain, sulfur dioxide. Okay, so these are problems with fossil fuels. Now, they, they can ask you, again very rarely, about the fact that new power stations actually have methods of trapping these gases uh, coming out of the power station. If you see a power station, they'll have those big chimneys, and those big chimneys can have things in there that catch carbon dioxide as it tries to escape before it gets into the atmosphere and can contribute to global warming they can actually capture it. And there's actually talk about them pumping it back underground to where they mined out the coal from or took the, extracted the oil or the gas uh, and storing it under there. So it doesn't actually get into the atmosphere and lead to global warming. Um, similarly with sulfur dioxide, they can have 
things in the chimneys that actually neutralise or trap the sulphur dioxide before it escapes into the atmosphere and causes acid rain. Okay? It's a very small bit, but it's worth mentioning it could come up. They can actually reduce this negative effect by trapping these waste gases. And trapping is the word you need to use. They can trap them before they escape. Um, nuclear power. So fossil fuels done, we can talk about nuclear power. The reaction that goes on in the nuclear power station, such as this one, if you can see it, but um, I'm sure many of you probably know what Springfield nuclear power plant looks like, so it has these big cooling towers. Um, it's actually nuclear fission reaction. Uh, nuclear fission comes up more in P2, the actual details of it, but you do need to know that the fuels needed for it are uranium and plutonium. Those are the two fuels that go into the reactor for nuclear fission. It works in a very similar way to a fossil fuel power station. So the flow diagram is very similar to the previous flow diagram I showed you for fossil fuels. The only difference being is you don't burn the uranium or plutonium. You do this reaction, this nuclear fission, and it still gives off energy as heat, which is absorbed by water. Water turns to steam. That steam has kinetic energy, turns a turbine, and the turbine feeds a generator which generates electrical energy. So it's very similar in the fact that you're using a reaction, not burning, not combustion, to heat up water to turn it to steam to drive around a turbine and generate your electricity. Okay. That's what these cooling towers are. They're actually to cool down the water um, and release the, the heat from the water so it can be pumped back around and then turned into steam again to turn a turbine. Okay. So, it works in a similar way to the flow diagram I showed you before, but the first reaction is different. It's nuclear fission to generate the energy. Advantages to it, it does not produce carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide. So nuclear fuel doesn't produce these harmful greenhouse um, and acid rain gases, polluting gases. So that's a real bonus to it. So it's not actually polluting the environment uh, in a kind of way. And it also does produce a large quantity of energy for a small amount of fuel. So a big advantage to it creates a lot of energy for just a small amount of fuel. Disadvantages are that fuel is not infinite. Okay? It's not, it will run out if we use too much nuclear energy. We only have a certain supply of uranium or plutonium. Um, and we will run out of it if we use it for lots of nuclear power stations. It will last more than, longer than fossil fuels, but... Um, it's still a finite resource, okay, we will run out of it. It does produce radioactive waste, so although I said it doesn't produce carbon dioxide and sulphur dioxide, it still produces radioactive waste which has to be disposed of. And currently, what they do is they take all the radioactive material, they encase it in a, in a drum made of steel, and they fill that drum with concrete. Um, and then they have to dispose of that by burying it underground or burying it deep in the ocean which uh, can lead to problems. Uh, there's a risk of an accident, so there could be an explosion. Okay? We've probably heard of Chernobyl. Um, you don't need to know the details of it at this stage, uh, but um, there was a, a, what was called a nuclear meltdown, and it released a large amount of radioactive material over a wide area, um, and that has damaged the area, damaged the actual habitats, and killed the people who lived close by. It also has the longest start-up time of um, any of the like, fuels. So, whereas I said gas, you can turn on a gas power station and uh, be generated electricity within minutes, whereas a nuclear power station takes a few hours to start get going um, before it actually produces electricity in enough for it to be useful. So, it's got the longest start-up time of all the uh, fuels that we're going to look at. Okay. So, nuclear power has its good points, has its major bad points, but you could be asked to make a comparison between nuclear power and fossil fuels. And indeed, you could be asked to compare it to any of the renewables that I'm going to go through. Now, I haven't broken these up into separate sections. I've kind of bracketed them all into uh, a renewable category, and that's the first thing you should be saying about them if you're asked about any of these types of producing or methods of producing electricity. They are renewable, and it's a big advantage to them. Okay. So we've got solar energy, which if you can see the picture, solar panels on the roof of buildings that are quite getting more and more common these days. Um, 
They are good because they are renewable. As I said, the sun has got um, a near limitless supply of energy as far as we're concerned um, that we can utilize. And it has no polluting gas emissions. So it doesn't give off your carbon dioxide, it doesn't give off sulfur dioxide, and there are big benefits to it. Okay. Disadvantages though, it is very expensive to buy, to manufacture solar panels to put on your house, and the payback time um, is long. You have to have these working for a long time before you actually make money on them because they cost so much to install in the first place. They're quite inefficient actually. They don't generate um, as much electricity as you would think um, for the amount of space they take up. Um, that's not to say they're bad, but they're just less efficient than you would actually presume they, they would be. Um, they have big solar fields, maybe in the Sahara Desert, where uh, there's lots and lots of powerful solar energy, lots of, lots of powerful light energy from the sun uh, that can actually generate a large amount of electricity, but on the roof of a house, um, it, it doesn't always generate as much as you might think it does. Particularly uh, if it's in the winter, when sunlight is less, um, or a big downside to them, they only work during the day, obviously, because that's when there's enough sunlight. Uh, the moon doesn't reflect enough of the sun's light for this to be effective, so therefore they only work during the day. So you need some way of storing that energy to be used at night if you're going to rely just on solar power. Moving on to wind, uh, you've probably seen a wind turbine somewhere before. Uh, they have one out at sea uh, at Ramsgate, or just off the coast of Ramsgate, I should say. Uh, they take up a huge amount of space because you need lots of these to generate enough uh, electricity. But again, same advantages to solar power. That's why I've bracketed these together. They're renewable. Uh, the wind is a near limitless supply, or limitless supply I should say, of energy, uh, kinetic energy, because the wind is movement, kinetic, transferred to electrical energy, which is what a turbine and a generator in the base does in a uh, wind turbine. They also again create no polluting gases, obviously they don't give off any carbon dioxide or any sulphur dioxide, so you're not going to have problems there with global warming or acid rain. But disadvantages to them, they're noisy, okay? They do make a fair bit of noise if you are close to them, um, and uh, that will affect things. I think we've got my camera crew arriving by helicopter, uh, so sorry if that's making a bit of noise at the moment. But they are noisy. They are, people think they're unsightly, so a lot of people oppose um, this if it was being built nearby them. They don't like the sight of them, they think they look ugly. I don't actually think they look too bad, but if they were going to build one just behind where I live, I might have a different uh, perspective on it. So they're, they're seen as unsightly or ugly or don't look very nice. And they're also, as you can probably guess, quite inconsistent. That means that uh, the wind, sometimes it's really windy, sometimes it's not so windy. Today it's quite still, they wouldn't be generating much electricity at this time. So they have variable power. So their output of power can be quite variable. It can be quite, if it's very windy, can generate a lot of electricity, but when the wind drops, uh, they generate less. So that could be an issue of them. Very inconsistent or unreliable. Okay. So that's wind. And we've got water. And in water, I've bracketed wave, tidal, and hydroelectric power, HEP, uh, into this category. Um, geographers will probably hate me for that, but that's in science how you can, you can have them together. Wave power is where you would build up a wave barrier on a coastline, um, but you would need to be near some coastline uh, to do that. And they actually convert the waves, the, the ocean's waves, into um, energy. A tidal power is where you, you build a, a barrier across, um, there's one on the Thames, one of the Thames estuaries, which is a, a side bit of the Thames, uh, which actually, as water builds up, can generate electricity. Uh, and they all do it by water going through a chamber which turns a turbine. So uh, I'll come to actually the energy transfers because they are a bit trickier. Um, and hydroelectric uh, is where you, you dam a river. So you have a river and you build a dam across the river and the water gets trapped behind it and it does flow through a little chamber um, and turn a turbine. Now the reason I say the energy that's actually going on is because hydroelectric, they occasionally ask you about the energy transfers in hydroelectric, again a small piece but worth knowing that 
When you build a dam across a river, it's actually gravitational energy that's the store of energy that's converted to electrical. Okay? Now, you could say it's kinetic because the water's moving, and you wouldn't be wrong, but really, with a hydroelectric power plant, uh, they're looking for uh, gravitational energy because rivers always flow down from mountains to the sea. So they're always going downhill. So it's always gravitational energy that's supplying the energy. Um, and that's one thing students often get confused by, hydroelectric. It's gravitational energy that's causing, uh, that's supplying the energy in, and electrical energy is what's generated from the process. Uh, advantages to these water-powered things, they're renewable, no polluting gases again, similar to the previous two, exactly the same really. But also they're fairly reliable, okay? rivers always flow, um, you've always got waves in the ocean, the tide always goes in and out. So you've always got that supply of energy and therefore you've always got that supply of electricity. So they are actually reliable. For renewable energies, they're one of the most reliable, um, except for possibly the next one I'm going to go to as well. The big disadvantages to these, though, um, are that they destroy habitats. So if you build a barrier in the, the sea uh, or a, a dam across a river, you're actually going to destroy the habitats of the animals that live there. The fish, if it's in the sea, or because you actually flood an area when you build a dam, the water builds up behind it, uh, you're flooding the entire area and you destroy the habitats of all the animals that live in that, in that valley around that river. So it's a, it's a big downside to uh, water power, wave hydroelectric power, that it destroys the habitats. And also you need water nearby, obviously. You need to live near the coast or uh, by a river to actually harness that energy and uh, get it and use it effectively. Next one, geothermal. So geothermal, they don't often ask about it, but it's worth knowing a bit about it. Uh, diagram, not amazingly clear on the board, but essentially what it is, is it's utilising the heat from underneath the surface of the earth. Okay? They actually pump water down into the earth, under the earth's surface, where it's warm, uh, and then that water gets heated up and steam rises back up, and that steam pushes a turbine again and the turbine generates electricity. Uh, you see a really common theme here, always rely on a turbine being linked to a generator, generating that electricity. Okay? So it uses heat from under the surface of the earth and it still produces steam which turns a turbine to generator. Advantages to it, there's no fuel costs, you don't need to supply any fuel in, it's renewable just like the others. Uh, that's always coming up if they're talking about one of these types of generated electricity, one of these methods, uh, and they produce no polluting gases. There's no polluting gases created from this because you're not actually burning anything. You're just cooling down water, which may release steam, uh, but you're not actually burning anything, so no carbon dioxide, no sulfur dioxide generated. Yeah. Uh, disadvantages though, Real big disadvantage is only a few areas where you can actually do this, where you can access enough heat under the ground to actually get uh, geothermal energy working. Iceland is a prime example. In Iceland, they use lots of geothermal energy. It's a great place to visit if you ever get a chance, but because it's volcanic and there's a lot of volcanic activity, they utilize a lot of geothermal energy. Geo, by the way, meaning earth, just like geography is a study of the earth, and thermal is um, heat. So heat energy, so using heat from the earth, okay? So, like I say, not polluted, renewable, uh, but very few places you can actually do it. Uh, it is reliable as well. If you've got access to this, it's a constant supply of, of energy, so it can be reliable too. Um, I did say, I would talk briefly about biofuels. So as I mentioned, biofuels, uh, you can just think of, in this case, you don't have to think about vegetable oils, but just like wood is a biofuel. Uh, you can grow trees, you can burn that wood uh, from the trees that you harvest, and you can use it to generate uh, electricity. Um, so it can be used in a power station. Uh, you're burning it, you are releasing CO2, uh, but it's carbon neutral because the plants that grow, that you're getting the energy from, or you're getting the fuel from, take in the CO2 when they grow. So it's called carbon neutral biofuel, just like in chemistry. Um, so that's... Uh, that's not dissimilar to that at all. 
So when we've generated our electricity, you will see on all the diagrams I've put up, they're always linked to these things and these lines that come off of it. Um, and you probably know what those are called. And they are all connected to what's called the national grid. So the national grid is um, a series of pylons and cables that actually cover the whole of Britain or the UK and supply electricity to homes everywhere across it. Okay, so they're a, they're a series of pylons and cables, really. And they also have a very important bit to them, these transformers. And that's the thing that uh, is, is most often asked about when they ask about the national grid um, at GCSE. Uh, the step up and step down transformers. Uh, not talking about robots in disguise, but things that are very important parts of uh, national grid that actually help the energy transfer process. So over here we've got our power station that's generating our electricity. Uh, and that generates electricity at about, I think it's around 25,000. Uh, you won't get asked to remember the exact numbers. I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think it's around 25,000 volts of electricity is generated by the power station. Now the step-up transformer actually increases that voltage massively. Uh, it can turn it up to, this is 132,000 volts in my uh, diagram here but it can actually go up to anywhere near 400,000 volts. Um, and when it does step up that energy from 25,000 to 132,000, it actually reduces the current that's flowing. So the voltage increases and the current drops. And that's what's important. So the voltage goes up and the current falls. It travels through the cables until it gets nearly to the houses. And uh, usually in villages, in towns, you can find somewhere where there's a transformer station, uh, which is usually fenced off because there's a massive amount of electricity, uh, 400,000 volts or something like that, going into it. And they may have two step-down transformers in there because uh, they need to turn that voltage right down to something that's safe to use in your homes. Now, again, it's more in P2, but the voltage that goes into your houses is 240 volts. Um, of electricity that goes in and uh, we need to step that back down to that voltage so it's safe for us to use in our homes. So that's what our step down transformers do. They decrease the voltage and by doing that they actually raise the current. So step up transformer increases the voltage and reduces the current and a step down transformer just does the opposite, reduces the voltage raises the current back up okay so we get it in our homes um, in a much safer lower voltage than actually traveled down the cables now what's the point of all that that's what's really relevant what's the point of this process why do we step it up only to step it back down again it's because of what goes on here this can be quite a large distance and in that large distance energy can be lost so by doing this, stepping this up to a really high voltage but low current, we actually lower the amount of energy that's lost through the wires. Okay, that's what we're actually doing. We're lowering the amount of energy lost. It makes this transfer process more efficient. Okay, and then we need to step it back down to go into our homes um, to actually keep it uh, at a safe voltage for us to use. So that's the point of the process really. We step it up only so it transfers with lot, little loss of energy and then we step it back down to make it safe again. Okay. That's the overall process. Transporting electricity isn't cheap and occasionally you get asked questions about why um, do they not want to supply energy from the national grid to this house up in the mountains. And that's because actually transferring that energy all the way up into the mountains or a long distance is expensive. They have to build pylons, they have to lay the cables um, or put the cables across them um, and also the further they transport it the more energy is actually going to be lost so they actually it's expensive to transport electricity long distances so that's why as again it comes up occasionally why they might not connect some places to the national grid uh, which is a series of pylons and cables uh, because it's too expensive for them to do and it's not worth it if there's only a small number of people that live there uh, it won't be worth doing it. Okay. Um, similarly, uh, it makes me think about like wave power uh, being a really good form of um, generating electricity. Uh, they actually have to transfer that energy through cables 
uh, back to land for houses to use and that's costly as well so that's a disadvantage to that as well. Anytime you need to move electricity particularly if it's through the sea or under the sea uh, that costs a lot of money so there's a big downside. Okay. So we covered lots and lots of things on uh, generating electricity, on energy as a whole, energy transfers, heat energy transfers. As I said there's really only two main topics to uh, P1 and they are energy Okay, which we've gone over, heat energy transfer um, and electrical energy, uh, efficiency, all to do with different energy transfers. And then it goes on to waves. And that's what we're going to look at uh, for the last little bit. Now, I would normally have about 10 minutes left uh, and then go through some questions. But at this point, I don't think any questions have come in. Um, so unless any do, and I'll go through them at the end, uh, I'll carry on. And that gives me time to cover um, waves in a bit of detail. Once I've covered that, I pretty much would have covered everything in P1, really. Um, so if there's no more specific questions, then I'll, I'll, I'll finish up when I've, when I've gone through uh, everything that's on uh, my next following slides about waves. Um, so, properties of waves. These are the basic properties we need to know about them. Waves are all <coughs> vibrations which are transferring energy from one place to another. Okay, That's what a wave is uh, in physics terms. This is also a wave, but... It's not the type of wave you need to know for P1. Okay? You need to know two types of waves. Okay? One is longitudinal. Longitudinal, the way I remember it really for P1 is the only longitudinal wave they really ask you about is a sound wave. Okay? So sound waves are the only real longitudinal wave that, that comes up. And the way you can envisage a longitudinal wave, and often we do it in science lessons, and you may have already seen it, is by using uh, a slinky or a spring. Okay? And with that spring, you actually uh, hold it stretched out and then someone at one end will push uh, the slinky together and it will compress the, the spring um, and then that spring will, will open back up. And that series of, of compression, and they call this rare fraction, uh, rare faction, uh, is where it spreads out, um, is how the wave actually moves. It actually goes together and spreads out, goes together, spreads out, and moves along in that way. Okay, so I don't know, almost like a, a caterpillar moving, uh, but the particles actually don't actually move, they transfer the energy by compressing together and then spreading out all the way along. Uh, so that's how the wave moves. And the way that's described, an important way to describe it, is the vibrations or the oscillations, you can call them, are in the same direction as the direction of travel. So it's important that you know the oscillations or vibrations are in the same direction as the direction of travel. So the wave is moving in this direction and the vibrations are also in that direction. Okay? So they're moving in the same direction. Okay? Wave, vibrations. Okay? Moving in the same direction. That's what's important about this, uh, longitudinal waves. And as I say, sound is really the only example that comes up uh, to do with this. The other type of wave you need to know is transverse. So transverse are your normal waves that you would think about if you thought about a wave. These are the ones that, that when you draw a wave, it's more often um, what you're, you're thinking about. They have sort of midpoint, and uh, they're the ones that go up and then down, okay? that's your transverse wave, normal sort of wave moving along. The vibrations that are occurring, okay, as the wave is moving in this direction, so that's the direction of travel of the wave, it's moving along, so it's moving along that way, uh, the vibrations are going up and down, okay? so vibrations and movement. Okay. So the wave travels across and the vibrations go up and down. So this is a bit different to uh, our longitudinal wave where the wave uh, moves or the vibrations move in the same direction as the, the direction of travel. With that wave, you can, you can label up a few bits on it. And the diagram on here is very small, I appreciate. So, so I could label it up on, on this one as well. And you've got different parts to that wave. 
Okay. You've got the bit down the bottom, which is actually called the trough, which is the, the lowest point of the wave. Uh, and then you've got the bit at the top, which is the peak, and the highest point of the wave. Just like a mountain, uh, you've got a peak to it, and that's the highest point. Okay. So you've got your peak and your trough, the highest and lowest points of the wave, of the transverse wave. Then also within that wave, you have uh, the amplitude. Now the amplitude is the height of the wave. Now it's very important that you realise that the amplitude is um, the height of the wave from the midpoint. Okay? And it's the height of the wave from the middle. Okay? Not all the way from one peak to one trough, but just from that midpoint to the uh, to the peak or from the midpoint to the trough is this going to be the same. Uh, it's called the amplitude. Okay? And then the last thing you've got on there is you've actually got uh, a wavelength. And a wavelength is the length of a wave. Now it can be measured at several points, but it's the point for one complete wave. So from one peak uh, to another or one trough to another. And that's the wavelength. So that's the basics about waves really, okay? uh, they all transfer energy from one place to another, uh, you've got longitudinal waves which are these uh, areas of compression and rare refraction uh, which move along and sound is really the only one you need to know uh, for a longitudinal wave uh, and transverse wave and that's just about all other waves and we'll go into some specific ones in a second uh, but these have uh, your normal sort of up and down motion, whereas the wave goes just travelling in this direction. It's got a peak, a trough, the distance between two peaks or two troughs is the wavelength, and your amplitude is the height of the wave from the midpoint. Okay? So that's uh, the wave basics. And then also, some uh, properties of waves we have, we can use this formula, which again is given on the formula sheet, uh, something you need to calculate. If you can't see it on there, it is actually V equals F times, I believe uh, it's called lambda, uh, that, but it actually stands for the frequency, uh, the velocity is equal to the frequency times the wavelength, okay, is what that's referring to. As I say, it's, uh, it's given on your little formula sheet, they call the velocity the speed, but it's the same thing, so speed, wave speed, is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. Uh, I didn't talk about what frequency was actually, so coming back to this, frequency is how many waves you actually get. So a full wave would be all the way from where it starts going up to all the way where it goes down, that's one wave. So this would have a frequency of one, two, three. There's three waves in there, so my frequency would be three. Um, you'll be given a frequency uh, if you're asked to calculate the speed of a wave um, and the frequency is measured in hertz, the wavelength is measured in meters usually, um, and the speed is in meters per second, the speed always is. Okay, So that's your formula, but as I say, it's on the formula sheet, so you won't have to remember it, but you will have to use it and apply it to work out the speed of different waves uh, traveling in different substances. So, with waves, uh, they can do some, some things, they can reflect, they can refract. Uh, not rare, this is different to rear refraction, which I spoke about on a uh, longitudinal wave where it spreads out. Uh, this is a property or something that all waves can do. Okay? Reflection simply is where light comes in to a plane mirror. A plane mirror is uh, just a, a, a flat mirror, a flat mirrored surface. Okay? When light comes in, there's an angle, uh, and that angle is made between a line at 90 degrees to the mirror. That line is called the normal. You can get asked to draw that line. Um, it's always at 90 degrees to, the, to the, the mirror, or whatever the object is reflecting off of. Okay? So whatever this is that it's reflecting off of, the normal is at 90 degrees, right angles, to uh, that mirror, or reflected object reflection. The angle of instance is the angle between the ray of light that comes in and the normal. And when it hits that mirror, it will bounce off at exactly the same angle of reflection uh, as it came in. 
So the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Okay, the angle it hits the, the mirror at with regards to the normal is the same as the angle it comes out at. You occasionally ask to draw a reflected wave, or a reflected light wave, um, or reflected any wave really, it all works the same way. Um, and you need to try and get the angle uh, as close to uh, the angle it comes in at as possible. Now, they don't often measure the angle, but it just needs to appear that it goes at the same angle. Obviously, if I've got my light coming in here, and I draw my light coming out like that, it's not going to look like it's at the same angle. So you need to just get it roughly in the same um, angle. Um, also, what's important is light always travels in straight lines. It's a basic property of uh, light or waves. They travel in straight lines uh, unless they uh, get reflected or they get refracted. And refracted is the next sort of property of waves that you could uh, be asked about. Now, mainly we talk about light with these two things, but could be other waves as well. And refraction is when a ray of light travels from one medium, such as air, to another, such as glass, uh, it actually gets bent. It's to do with it changing its speed. Now, this is a, this is a thing where I'm not going to go into lots and lots of detail. I could do, but I'm not going to, uh, simply because uh, we don't have time, and uh, also I don't really see it get asked in lots of detail. But that's not to say it couldn't be, and you shouldn't know a bit about it, but really it's to do with when a ray of light goes from one medium, such as air, to another, such as glass, it actually gets sped up or slowed down, and that causes the light to bend. Okay? And when it leaves the glass back into the air, it will go back to the same angle it was travelling at. Okay? So it would have been moved because it's been bent as it travelled through the glass, but uh, it will return to the same angle once it's left the glass block. Okay? Refraction is a thing that you could actually go into a lot of detail in, but I don't often see it get asked in lots and lots of detail in exam papers. So that's why in this session I've decided not to go into it, but it's not to say it couldn't come up in a bit more detail. So if you want to find out some more about that, it might be worth finding out about it tomorrow or just doing a bit of a read around. Um, so that's basic properties of refraction, uh, reflection and refraction. Now, I haven't talked about diffraction as well. Diffraction's where... Um, waves actually travel through a small gap and actually get spread out. They often show it uh, like a small gap in a piece of card or something and they say that, that waves such as sound waves might be going like this. Uh, when they go through that gap they get spread out and spread out over a larger area. It can actually cause light to be split in like a prism uh, or split into a rainbow I should say, split into all the wavelengths of visible light. Uh, but again, it's not something I see come up incredibly often. Uh, but one thing I will point out about diffraction is that if this gap is equal to the wavelength, it's spread out wider. Okay? So when the gap is equal to the wavelength, or the object that it goes through is equal to the wavelength, diffraction is more. Um, I've seen it come up sort of once, uh, but it's important to, to know that as one point from one mark. Uh, one thing I have seen come up, and I was actually it was in the mock, and I was shocked that we didn't get the answer to it better than I thought we would. Um, sound can be reflected, and when a sound wave is reflected, it's called an echo. Okay? So remember that, that when sound wave is, is reflected, it's called an echo. An echo. An echo. Okay? So just remember, that's just a small bit again, but do remember sound waves create echoes. Um, Last of all with this before we move on, because we have got a little bit of time. And when you're looking into a mirror, you see a reflection. And that object that's in the mirror is actually a virtual image. The object in the mirror is a virtual image. You, the light that comes from you, is the actual image. Uh, so if I look directly at my computer, uh, it's actually there. That's an actual image that's reaching my eye and I'm picking up the light from it. Um, I can touch it, so that's how I know it's, it's the real image. Whereas the, if I looked at my computer in a mirror, um, it would be a virtual image. That's to say if I tried to touch it, I couldn't reach it. It appears behind the mirror the same distance that it's in front of the mirror. So that's another little bit as well. The, the image you get reflected in a mirrored surface 
is called a virtual image. Okay, uh, it's not the the real the real image that's actually just light being directly into your eye, directly sent into your eye. Okay, and you can tell because you can't reach out and touch it. The virtual image. Okay. Um, onto electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, now. The electromagnetic spectrum or electromagnetic waves, you need to know in the order they appear. Um, I was told a very clever way of uh, remembering this, um, and all credit to that person, Miss Walker, for teaching me. Uh, remember my instructions visible under X ray goggles is the waves in the uh, electromagnetic spectrum radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet. X-rays and gamma rays. Remember my instructions visible under X-ray goggles. Okay, there's a way to remember. You need to remember them and remember them in order. You can be asked to put them in order. They could give you this list with a few gaps missing. Um, you should also know that if you start from radio waves and go along to gamma rays, what actually happens is uh, the wavelength gets shorter. And when the wavelength gets shorter, the uh, frequency of them, the number of waves, gets more, so increases. Okay, so wavelength decreases as you go along, and frequency increases okay, as you go along. Remember my instructions, visible under X-ray goggles. Okay, it's a good way to remember the order of them. All electromagnetic waves, though, are transverse. They're all transverse waves. And as I said, the only longitudinal one you'll really need to know is sound waves. Uh, they all travel the same speed in a vacuum. Okay, so they're all traveling the same speed in a vacuum, the speed of light, because uh, we've got visible light in there. And they all transfer energy, uh, because as I said, all waves transfer energy from one place to another, and these are no different. So that's facts you can say about them. They also, they all get reflected, they all get refracted. Uh, these are things you can say about them. So if you're ever asked what do these waves have in common, they are all transverse, they all travel the same speed in a vacuum, they all transfer energy, they all can be reflected, refracted. Uh, those are the main points about them. Okay. You need to know the uses of some of these waves as well. So radio waves are used to send out uh, communication signals, so radio and TV can be sent via radio waves. Microwaves can be used to cook things, so they can be used for that, but make sure that if they're asking you how do microwaves get used for communication, you know that microwaves are used in mobile phones. So your microwave uh, also sends out mobile phone signals. Uh, it sends out signals in a mobile phone, this is, to a satellite, and they're then sent down to another mobile phone, and it's how you can connect to someone across the other side of the world. Infrared, and the main sort of use of them that we think of is uh, remote controls for TVs. It seems to be the one they like in uh, GCSE exams. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, visible light, we use that to see, uh, but we use it in torches. Uh, also lasers use visible light. Uh, ultraviolet, uh, you, you get asked less for the uses of these, but in some beds, uh, ultraviolet can be used. Um, X-rays is used to, to view bones or med medical uses, and gamma rays has medical uses as well. It can be used to uh, treat cancers, so it can be used to kill cancers. As you get further along the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, they actually get higher energy. So these are actually higher energy, and therefore are more harmful to humans than the waves at this end of the spectrum. So these are higher energy and therefore more harmful to humans. Gamma rays, although they can be used to treat cancer, can actually cause cancer as well. Uh, so you have to be careful with them. Okay. Remember my instructions, visible under x-ray goggles. Okay. Never forget the order. Okay. So I'm guaranteed to get that right in an exam. That's the electromagnetic spectrum. You should know uses of a few of these, a few of these uses. Remember those. You could be asked the use of different waves and what they have in common uh, are these things. Also, remember that the wavelength as you go along that order that I said decreases and frequency increases. Speed stays the same. Okay, they all travel the same speed for a vacuum. And the very last thing I'm going to talk about uh, tonight uh, is the origins of the universe. 
One of the theories for the origins of the universe is, of course, the Big Bang. Um, and that's the theory we have to learn about in P1. Uh, that's the one you will get examined on. Now, evidence for the Big Bang is uh, these two things. So things that lend themselves to, to proving that the Big Bang actually happened and it created everything in the universe is the Doppler effect. Doppler effect is actually quite a complicated thing if you go into great detail, but really you just need to know that when an object moves towards you at high speed, it's actually pushing the waves that are coming from it together. Now you can hear this with sound waves if you hear a fire engine or an ambulance coming down the road rapidly. When it's coming towards you, the sound will sound a certain pitch and then when it passes you, it will sound different. That's because the uh, pitch of the, the sound wave is actually caused by its frequency. Okay? And uh, if the frequency changes, the pitch changes and therefore it sounds a higher or lower pitch. So when the object is moving towards you, the waves are actually being compressed. Okay? As the waves are coming out, they're actually being compressed. So they're being squashed as the object's moving towards you. Um, that means that the, the waves are smaller wavelength and therefore higher frequency waves. Whereas when the object moves away from you, the waves are actually being stretched out. So the wavelength gets stretched out as the object moves away. And because of that, that actually makes it have a lower frequency because the wavelength increases. So it happens with sound, but it also happens with light as well. And it actually leads to a phenomenon called redshift. And it's where objects moving towards you, uh, or sorry, away from you in space, their light actually gets shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. So they appear red. Um, I've just put a little diagram up to show it. So I've seen it come up occasionally. Uh, they have, this is the section of visible light. Okay. And this is the, it's called the emission spectrum, but it's just where light is reaching you. This is the red end of the spectrum. I should have used the red pen to do it really, shouldn't I? Okay, so this is the, the red end of the spectrum. And this is the blue end of the spectrum. There are opposite sides. Um, when the light is actually sent out, uh, normally, like from our sun, you get the light appearing in these different wavelengths. Okay, they're just shown as lines on this diagram. When an object's moving uh, away from you rapidly, all of those lines are shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. They've all moved slightly this way. And we say it has been redshifted. Redshifted when the object is moving away from you because of the Doppler effect. Uh, the wavelength has been stretched out and it's been shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. Okay? So that's redshifted this object. And the more that shift has happened, the more it's shifted over to this end of the spectrum, the faster the object is moving away. And I've seen a question where they gave you three of these different, uh, they gave you the normal one and they gave you three more and they asked which of them was moving away from you uh, at, the, at the quickest. Similarly, you could have an object which has been, let's go back to the first one, okay, shifted that way towards the blue end of the spectrum. And this is called blue shift. Comes up far less uh, in P1, but I only mention it because I'm sure the astute of you could have guessed by now, if this is an object that's moving away from you rapidly, gets shifted towards the red end of the spectrum, this is an object that's coming towards you. And they have actually seen galaxies that are moving towards our galaxy, uh, and in millions of billions of years may well collide with our galaxy um, and cause, well, havoc really, if it does happen. The reason this proves, or is evidence for the Big Bang, is because the, the universe is still expanding. And because it's still expanding, if you imagine we were in the centre, those objects on the outside were um, moving outwards very rapidly. Uh, because I believe I am the centre of the universe, so everything is moving away from me at great speeds, and uh, everything is being redshifted, so the light is looking slightly red. So it proves that the universe is still expanding at this time. 
some scientists believe that eventually that will stop and it will come back in, everything will be blue shifted and it will go back together in what's called the big crunch, uh, only to re-explode again in another big bang. So that's the Doppler effect. When something's moving towards you, the wavelengths get compressed. Uh, when something's moving away, the wavelengths get stretched. And if an object's moving through space, light can be shifted towards the red end of the spectrum if it's moving away from you very rapidly. So some evidence for the Big Bang. And the last piece of evidence uh, that they talk about is called cosmic microwave background radiation, sometimes shortened to just CMBR, cosmic microwave background radiation. Okay? It's radiation that scientists have observed in space um, and it's just given out by because it's observed in all directions, 360 degrees, everywhere, it's coming from every single direction at once, and they reckon that it was created in the Big Bang when that explosion happened. It gave out this background radiation, microwave radiation, which is still uh, resonating, going out through space uh, today. So it's evidence that proves the Big Bang may have actually happened as the origin of the universe. So that's why they ask about these two things, the Doppler effect, particularly because of redshift and cosmic microwave background radiation, prove that, or give evidence, don't necessarily conclusively prove, but give good evidence to support the Big Bang Theory for the creation of the universe. Okay. Um, we've had about an hour and a half, okay, I've gone through just about everything in P1. Um, I haven't got into detail on some topics, as I've said, uh, but in an hour and a half, I've gone through as much as I can. As I say, I pretty much guarantee you're going to get a question on heat energy transfer. If they link it to a vacuum flask, then it wouldn't surprise me, but there's no guarantees. Um, you will get a question about generating electricity, I'd imagine, um, in one form or another. As I say, I'm saying these now, but I haven't seen the paper. I don't see the paper. I can't give you any 100%. So they're just what? For reading lots of papers, looking at the type of questions that come up, we see come up again and again, and are likely to come up uh, in this one. And then, as I say, there'll definitely be something on uh, light and waves, and the electromagnetic spectrum, I imagine, will come up, in, even if it's only a small bit. So remembering my instructions, visible under x-ray goggles, the order of them, and what they have in common is going to be important. All that's left for me to say is just uh, good luck, not tomorrow this time, but on Wednesday. If you do have any questions based on this video that you haven't emailed in, come and see me tomorrow um, and I'll go through it with you in time I've got. Um, but otherwise, uh, like I say, good luck on Wednesday. Thanks for watching.